my experience with God. I was surfing and um, I had a diving accident where it appears as though I was pronounced clinically dead for approximately 15 minutes. And um, during that time, I found myself caught up in the presence of God and just continually wave after wave of his love and acceptance began to flow through me. It's like a tangible presence of God and his, and his light just flooded me with incredible peace. And as I stood in his presence and, and um, encountered more of God, it radically transformed my life. Prior to this, as you were saying, I was, I was an, um, a non-Christian, I was an atheist, um, and my concept of God was, uh, well, he wasn't there. It was, just, it was just all fairy tales. It was all mythology. It was obviously f for weak people who believed in religion, couldn't handle reality. So for me, it was a transforming point in my life. I was 24 years of age. Um, and I had been traveling for two years from 1980 to 82, uh, surfing, like hitchhiking around the world through Southeast Asia and through Africa. And I'd ended up on a small island called Mauritius. This island had great surf, um, good diving. I thought I could retire here. <laughs> I'd sailed there in 81 and seen it and, and gone back to it from Africa. And um, the fishermen that I lived with were Creoles. They were uh, laid back, lived off the ocean. Um, and I just surfed with them and dived with them. While I was diving uh, on the island, they taught me to night dive. Now I'd, and taught people how to dive and instructed them. I was a qualified lifeguard, but I'd never night dived. And these fishermen taught me to night dive. It was quite freaky, you know, going out at night. But we used to dive on the outer reef. Mauritius, it drops off about 12, 13,000 feet. It's basically a submerged mountain. And so we'd dive on the outer reef uh, from 11 at night to about 1 in the morning. And as we dived, we'd, we'd look with our diving torches because the crabs and the crayfish would come out and they're scavengers, so they'd scavenge the reef. And with your torchlight, you could blind them. And with your leather gloves, just pick them up. Um, so we would catch as much seafood as we could, sell it to the tourist hotel, which is how the fishermen earned their living. And for me, I wasn't into the money. I was just into seafood. So <laughs> go home, cook a bunch up, have a good feed, and you know, crawl into bed about 2 in the morning and have a bunch of seafood. You know, parrotfish would be asleep. So you get a few fish for dinner and um, plenty of seafood. And so we were living on these, you know, when you travel for two years, you've got to live pretty cheaply. And so we were living on about a dollar to two dollars US a day in small huts on the village, near the village. This particular night I went out diving. It was a bit different because I, I saw there's a storm at sea and I thought, oh, there's something, maybe the surf will come up on the reef. So I'd die for years. So I thought, oh, I talked to my friend Simon, I said, oh, Simon, uh, the surf might come up, I'd be dangerous. He said, oh no, uh, this, this storm of mist, Sassian. We go to a new place tonight. You, you, you see best diving in Mauritius. Now, like a good fisherman, he threw out his bait, reeled me in, and so at um, 11 that night, we got all our diving gear in the fishing boat and rowed off out through the lagoon, crossed the outer reef, and then rowed and poled our way down from, from Tamarin Bay, where I was living, to a place called Riviere Noir, Black River. As we slipped in, it was quite dark because the clouds were coming in, so there was no real moonlight, and, and it was a bit, it was a little bit of a chop on the water. But as I slipped into the water, my two friends had already gone in. As I slipped in, something smashed in my arm and stung me. Oh, I wondered what on earth it was. It felt like an electrical shock. Now, the other two divers had swum off to my left, going up onto the reef, and I'd just been hit by something. I couldn't see what it was. It was excruciating pain, um, like electricity had gone into my arm. My first thought, electric eel. I thought, well, I've never seen an electric eel, don't even know, you know what I mean, except in an aquarium. What was that? So I looked around the water and started making out these jellyfish. I thought, well, it can't be them. You know, I mean, jellyfish don't do that. You know, they'll sting you, but nothing like that. And, but these jellyfish are a bit different. They were bell-shaped, at the, at, or torpedo-shaped at the top, then box-shaped, finger-like tentacles. I thought, well, is that, a, is that a jellyfish? Yeah, it must be. So I reached out and grabbed it with my gloves, and sure enough, it was a jelly. As I swam through, I had no idea that I'd just reached out with my leather gloves and grabbed potentially the sick, well, some books say the deadliest, some say the second deadliest uh, creature known to man, a box jellyfish, obviously, because it's box-shaped. But I'd never read anything on it. I'd never heard about it. And so here, I just had a box jellyfish go through my hand. Now, 
this particular species in Australia is, is well known and has killed over 70 people. In New Zealand, no one's really even heard of them because it's colder water, we're further south. So these particular jellyfish are more in the tropical regions. And it has killed over 70 people. It's so deadly um, that some scientists are now saying the venom is, is, is more deadly than a cobra, taipan and black mamba. But as this, as this jellyfish went through my hand, I thought, oh, well, I wonder what that is. Kept swimming. Then as I kept looking for craze, something else smashed in my arm. This time I saw the tentacles of this jellyfish going past me. I realised, oh man, I must have been hit the first time by one. I began to swim over towards the reef to talk to my friends about them, and another one hit me. And I thought, gosh, there's so many. There's, there's heaps of them in the water. It's like I'd swum into like a, 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 a whole soup of them. Now, jellyfish are very hard to see at the best of time because they're so transparent, but at night, very, very hard to see. And they were kind of smashing into me. As I asked my friend to surface, he came up. He said, Kiss the fair, Mom, what's happening? I, I said, Something hit me, Simon. He said, You get out on the reef, brother. We have a look. So he had been swimming off to the left, and the jellies were over here to the right, and he hadn't seen them yet. As I put my head back into the water to climb up onto the reef, coming off the, the outer reef, just the surge of the tide, was a jellyfish being dragged back into my face. As I put my face directly in its path, I had one shot. It was either going to hit my neck, or all I did was just roll in the water, throw my arm in front of my face to protect my throat, and got hit a fourth time. As the fourth one hit me, I pulled the tentacles off and climbed up onto the coral reef. There's a low tide, so it's about two foot cover on the reef. As I stood there, I looked at my arm with my, my torch, and amazed, what amazed me is my arm had already swollen to double its normal size. Where the tentacles are hit were like burn blisters, and I could feel the toxin pumping through my blood system up into my lymph glands with excruciating pain. I thought, man. What's happening? My right lung started to be constricted as I stood there. Perspiration was pouring off me, and it felt like a brandy knight had been put on my arm. As my friend Simon came out of the water, he looked at my arm, and in French he went, Kiss a fit, Jan, what's happening? I showed him my arm. He went, Oh, It's like he knew what it was. And when he said in French, Oh, I, re I recognised it to be an invisible one. Well, this jellyfish was so invisible, I thought, Yeah, okay. Oh, bizarre. He said, Pardon, oh, bizarre, duck, Stephanie for you. And in and, and French, he's telling me, safety means the end. Uh, one's enough to kill you. Now, this man had been diving as a child. I, he was one of the most respected fishermen in the village. The Creoles hated diving at night. It took courage for a man to conquer the fear of darkness and night diving. So they respected him for it. And so he stood there, and I watched him turn his torch onto his face. And he went as white as a sheet. He said, how come you not know, Ian? This one kill you, brother. I said, I not know someone. You think white men know everything, huh? I not know this one. He said, uh, how many, uh, how many hit you, huh? How many tuck? I went, cut, cut on this hour, four. He went, impossible, impossible, allez, allez, vitamin, cut from my hospital. Now, this man loved me. I knew him. He's a great friend of mine. And, I mean, I knew that when he was telling me to get out of here, we had to move. And I heard him say hospital, cut which was just up behind the village. Trouble is, I'm standing on the outer reef, miles away from the hospital, it's the middle of the night. He drags me back into the water. The other night diver comes alongside me, and I know that they're protected because they've got full wetsuits. To them, the water's cold, you see. To me, the water's hot. My wetsuit, unfortunately, was a short sleeve vest with a long john. My forearms are exposed, and my neck. The other divers had full uh, hoods on, booties, I mean, and full steamers, three mil steamers. So they were, they were completely protected. As they came alongside me, they pulled me up to the side of the boat. The young boy, who's a 14-year-old kid from the village, grabbed my left arm and began to pull me to safety. As they did, my right arm, which was paralysed, trailing in the water, got hit with a fifth one. As I felt that, I thought to myself, what on earth have you done to deserve this kind of punishment or payback? I had a flood of memories of stuff that had done wrong in my life. And here I am thinking, well, there's no use thinking about that, whether I deserve it or not, I'm dying. I better keep my head together here. They dragged the fishing boat over the coral reef into the lagoon. As they did, I, I heard them yelling to the young boy to get me to shore. I turned and said, Simon, come with me, please help me. He said, Ian, uh, no more to, uh, wait, uh, go, brother, you die, allez, allez. And I realized I was in trouble, man. I turned and said, Simon, my arm, what can I do? And, I, and, he, and he spoke to me in French. I didn't understand. I said, je ne comprends pas, pas. Je ne comprends. I cannot understand you. He put his finger out and motioned with his finger to urinate. I thought he means to pee on your arm. Yep. I thought, that's it. Urinate. 
vinegar will do it. Maybe urine will help and be like a bush medicine. Peeling my wetsuit off because it's constricting my breathing. I urinated it over my arm, made sure I didn't rub the toxin any more, and got changed in my sweat. See, my wetsuit was preventing me from breathing. So as I got in changed, I sat down on the boat and thought I must keep as calm as possible. I thought if my heart beats too quickly, the it. adrenaline rush will pump the toxin, hit my vital organs, I'm gone. So I'm a lifeguard, so I know what's going down. Okay. I know I need to get antitoxins. Mm -hmm. The way these guys are reacting, it's not some little joke. This is life-death stuff. As the, young, as the young boys pull me through the lagoon, I'm sitting there as calm as possible, but I feel the poison move into my kidneys like someone stuck their fist into my back as the poison continue to move down the right-hand side of my body. Tinges of it are coming through into my eyes and I'm having difficulty seeing. It's getting blurry as I'm looking at the beach. I thought, man, this is deadly stuff. As I hit the beach, the young boy motions for me to get out. I take one step forward and my right leg crumples underneath me as I collapse into the bottom of the boat. As I hit the bottom, I realize the poison has already numbed or paralyzed the right-hand side of my body. The young kid says, put the arm around my neck, so I do that, grab my um, right arm, which is paralyzed, hang and hang on to him, and this young kid does an amazing feat, he's only a small kid, carried me up across the sandy beach, which is really hard, up through the, uh, the houses and the bungalows and the palm trees, up onto the main road. As he got me there, he turned and, and, and yelled in French that he wanted to go and help his, get his brothers, that he's afraid. He said, mon frère, mon frère, sur la plage. And I realized he was afraid that his brothers would be killed. And so the kid panicked. I said, no, ambulance, gendarme, you know what I mean? Please. And, and, and the kid took off. As, a, as I sat there on the road, the poison hit me, and I started to feel very weak and tired. And I had no idea that this particular poison often kills within 10 or 15 minutes. This particular jellyfish usually takes adults down within 10 or 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. What generally happens is that they fall into a coma, never come out of it. Here I am, finding myself very tired and very sleepy. I just lay down on the ground, thinking that I'm just holding it together. As I do, I feel my eyes beginning to shut. And as my eyes begin to close, I hear a voice speak to me. He said, son, if you close your eyes, you shall never awake again. I thought, what? Who said that? As I looked to my right, I expected to see a man standing next to me, but there was no one there. I thought, that's bizarre. I just heard a man speak to me. I looked around, there's no one there. And just to set your mind at rest, you know, we're not used to hearing voices. Right. So talking to you out of the middle of nowhere, they have your straight jacket in the, in the padded <laughs> cell, bounce around like a ping pong ball, you know what I mean? So I am, I am lying there hearing a voice speak to me, but there's no one there. What did the voice say? Close your eyes, you'll never awake again. I thought, that means death. Are you idiot? That would have been a coma. That's not sleep. That's comatized certain death. I look at it now in hindsight. Had I not heard that voice, I know I'd have closed my eyes and that'll have been it. I'd have died. I'd have been like most of the other people in, in Australia that have been killed by this thing. Slip into a coma, never come out. Within 10 minutes, they're dead. And I was in peak condition. I hadn't eaten meat for years. I was a vego. And I mean, I was in top condition, not an ounce of fat on me, but this poison was taking me down. And I thought, I've heard that voice, whatever it is, it says you're going to die. So I stood up, fought off the, t the, the, the death that was coming on me as best I could, and found my left leg was still strong enough to support my weight. I used my right leg as a crutch and put my weight onto the left-hand side of my body and hobbled down the road looking for help. All the lights are out. There's a deserted part of the island anyhow. All these big homes, but the French don't come down except in the summer, you see. And there's, this is May. There's no one there yet. As I moved down, I could see a small petrol station, Caltech station. I, I, I hobbled in there, and amazingly enough, three East, the, the, the petrol station was closed, but the, there were three East Indian men in their taxis. I leaned up against one of their cabs and they said, oh, you're drunk. I said, I'm not drunk, I'm dying. I've been stung by poisonous jellyfish, sur la plage, on Visaba, I need to get to Katramon Hospital. They said, oh, uh, we have French client restaurant. We not meet other passengers. Sorry, uh, sorry, white man. Cannot help you. Walked away. I said, I'm dying. Please help me. They kept walking. I said, I, have, I give you money. They stopped. You know, in certain parts of the world, money speaks, especially to taxi drivers. Yeah. They stopped. As they stopped, they turned, one put his hand out and he said, um, how much money you give me, white man? I take you hospital. He looked at his watch to see if he could pull another fear in. Well, I'm dying here in front of him and he's arguing over the fear. I said, look, I don't care for the money. 
uh, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, who cares? I'm dying. He put his hand and he said, let me see your money uh, now, white man. I take you hospital. Well, at that point, I'm thinking, I don't believe this guy. I said, look, I don't have it with me. The moment those words came out, that was a mistake because all three of them walked away laughing. They said, you have no money, you stupid white man. What do you think we are? Walk away. I heard this voice speak to me and said, son, are you willing to beg for your life? As I heard that, I thought, beg? I've seen men in Africa beg. Yes, I'm boss. Yes, I'm boss. I couldn't stand seeing it. Coming from New Zealand, I've never seen stuff like that. And so I couldn't stand seeing a man beg to another man. But I watched these men walk. I thought, beg? I wonder if I begged. I bet you that will work. These Indians have never seen a white man beg. Not in this part of the world. I've got nothing to lose. I'm nearly dead. I slipped down onto my knees in front of them, fell onto my knees because my right leg was gone. My left leg was weak. Lifted my right hand, which is paralyzed, and pleaded for my life. As I did that, two of them kept walking, lighting up a fact. Thought it was a great joke. The third one stopped and looked at me. I said, look, I am dead serious. It's dead set, man. I'll die in front of you. If you don't help me, I have the money. Please help me. He walked over towards me, helped me to my feet without a word, put me in his taxi. I thought, great. As he took off towards the hospital, he turned to me and he said, um, what hotel room you stay, white man? Uh, I get my money from you. I thought, hotel room, money? This guy's still looking at money. Well, I don't stay in a hotel. I, I stay in the bungalow, I responded to him. I stay on the beach with a fisherman. He said, you lie to me. You tourist, you stay hotel. I said, I'm not a tourist, I'm a traveler. I live, I live not in the hotel, I live in, the, in, the, in Tamarin Bay with a fisherman in a bungalow. He said, uh, you, you, you stay Tamarin Bay Hotel, because there's a small hotel there near the village. I said, no, man, I stay with a fisherman. Uh, please, I have the money. He said, you lie to me, I take you to a tourist hotel. They look after you. Why you lie to me? Why you do this to me? He didn't understand. He didn't understand. No money, that's it, no hotel room, forget it. He thinks I've scammed him. He pulls off the main road down to the village where I live. As he stops, across from the village is a small Chinese hotel. He, he, he stops, he said, you get out now. I said, okay, okay, get out, man. Stop hassling me. I have the money, please. Huh? He said, and, and I try to get out. As I try to move, the left leg, I found to my horror, was now paralyzed also. The toxin had taken the entire lower trunk out. I turned and said, my legs are gone, man. Please help me. Huh? I have the money. He said, you get out now. I said, I can't, my legs are gone. He took my safety belt off, opened the passenger door, and just shoved me out, eh? As, he, as, he, as I flew out the door, I couldn't believe what was happening. But I looked up to see that when I hit the ground, my legs didn't make it. My feet were still caught in the door sill of the passenger side of his taxi. He couldn't close the door. I watched him lean over from the driver's seat, shove my feet out, and look at me in the face in disgust, close the door and drive off. I thought, I don't believe it. Why on earth would a man do that? For 50 bucks, man. All he has to do is another five, 10 minutes up the hill and I'm in the hospital. As he took off, I lay there and thought, I don't want to live on this miserable planet. If that's how fellow man treats fellow man for 50 miserable bucks, I'm not afraid to die. If it's my time to die now, if my number's up, do yourself a favor, son, and die here. I'm sick of this place. Now I lay there thinking that's it. But as I lay there, one of the security guards in the hotel must have seen the, the taxi. See, he ran out, shone his torch around the car park to see if there's any tourists coming late from the airport. Here I was on the ground in a crumpled heap. As he ran over, I heard the voice of a fisherman, one of the fishermen. I thought, that's Danielle. He said, I heard his voice saying, Kiss of fear, Ian. What happened to you, brother? Never see you like this. What you do on the ground, man? What you take tonight? He thought I was drunk or stoned or something. And so he ran over. And, and he's my drinking buddy from the village. I didn't realize he was a security guard, you see. Did a bit of extra money on the side, you know. And so I pulled my sweatshirt up, showed him a scarred forearm. The moment he saw it, he realized, because he's a diver, he said, Oh, he's up. I went, we, 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 Daniel. He said, pardon, Stephanie for you. You dive with Simon tonight, Le Mans. said, we. He said, pardon, carry me in his arms. He raced me to the hotel. Near the swimming pool, there was the bar, and the Chinese owners that ran the place had closed the bar, so all the tourists had gone to bed, but they were there gambling, playing mahjong amongst themselves, drinking whiskey. As these Chinese men looked at me, they said, what's wrong with you? you you're drunk. I said, I'm not drunk. Uh, uh, I'm dying. I need to go to Kutcherbong Hospital. Please help me. I've been stung by a poisonous jellyfish. And as, it, as I'm speaking this, Danielle takes off into the night. As these men looked at me, 
I said, I'm trying to explain. I said, we, we don't understand you. What you say? We don't understand you. I said, my arm, I pulled my sleeve up. It worked for my friend just a minute ago. I thought if they see my scars on my arm, they might realize I'm in serious trouble. So I pulled a, my, my sweatshirt up. They saw the scarred forearm. And the Chinese owner, he stood up and said, oh, what you do, you stupid white man? You put the needle in the arm? Oh, the old man, he take the opium, huh? <laughs> well, pipe, why you, why you put the needle in, you stupid white man? I'm sitting there going, where's Danielle gone? These guys think I'm a drug addict, and I'm nearly dead. Mm -hmm. As I sit there, I see out of the corner of my right eye, my fingers start twitching. As I turn, I see muscle tissue between my knuckles going into spasms. My, within a few seconds, my whole arm starts to tremble. It moves up into my face, and my teeth begin to literally be smashed into each other as my jaw goes out of control. Next minute, my entire face and body is in a, what I call the death rattles, muscular contortions, shaking to bits in front of them. As this deadly shaking's going on, I watch the Chinese men run towards me and try and hold me down. As they do, I'm throwing them off like rag dolls. My body comes out of this deathly shakes and I feel go through the core of my body an icy cold breeze, like a uh, very, very cold. So I'm freezing, freezing, man. They ran and got blankets. The old guy thought it must have taken a poison in my stomach. He tried to pour milk down my throat, at least he was thinking. As I'm sitting there, I feel the poison moving into my bone marrow and the, not the poison, but death, like an icy cold death, necrosis, moving into my bone marrow and coming up towards the, in the, to my upper body. Mm -hmm. As I'm sitting there, I know if this necrosis hits my upper body, I'm going to die in front of them. I'm gone. I'm dehydrated, par paralyzed, muscular contortions, now necrosis setting in. At university, I'd done veterinary science as one of my subjects, and I did my degree in agriculture, so I knew from my own physiology I was in serious trouble. I had to get to the hospital. I turned looked in the car park of the hotel, one vehicle. I recognized it instantly to belong to the Chinese owner who was now standing next to me. I said, sir, your car, could you please take me to Katramon Hospital or I'll die in front of you. Please help me, sir. I'm nearly dead, eh? Can you take me in your car? The Chinese man, he looked at his car. He put his hand on my shoulder. He said, oh, my car, huh? Cannot lie. How come you so worry, uh, white man? Huh? We have ambulance for you. Don't worry. Huh? Cannot take my car. We have ambulance for you. How come you so worry? How come I so worry? I'm about to die, mate. You feel like hitting someone? <laughs> yes. I mean, I'm not an angry person or, or, or a vindictive kind of, you know what I mean? I'm not. I'm pretty mellow, but I tell you what, I felt like punching his lights out. I sat there and every part of me thought, how can I rearrange his face? <laughs> hey, you know, you hate it when someone touches you. You know what I mean? They're, in your, they're just in your space. Well, there's not only in my space, it's in my face. I thought I'll hit him. I was just about to plant him one, but my arm wouldn't respond. My mind was saying, smash him. My hand wouldn't move. I thought, great, it's paralysed. I tried my left hand, it moved. I thought, what on earth could I do with my left hand before I died? I thought, my forehead. I could give him a headbutt. So I, I mean, play a lot of rugby at home, you know, I mean, every now and then you're getting some pretty heavy stuff. So I'm about to rip him down into my forehead. As I'm about to do that, this, this voice comes again, said, son, if you do that, the adrenal rush will kill you. The toxin's too close to your heart. I thought, that's true. I looked away. I thought, if I survive this, I'll find you. I mean, oh, I'm going to get you, Jack, you're history. I'm staring out here controlling my anger, again wondering what this voice was. But it had literally just stopped me from killing myself. As I looked away, trying to control it, my anger, I watched my friend Danielle come sprinting towards me. Next to him, another security guard. As they grab in their arms, they carry me towards the entrance of the hotel, and I see as, we're, as they carry me, the headlights of a small vehicle comes flying into the car park. As I see it come around, it's an ambulance. Small Renault with an am ambulance written on the side of it. The guy that's driving it doesn't see us because his headlights miss us, and it was a Creole that rang them, so they thought the boys must be right. stoned or drunk or off their face, false alarm. The Frenchman driving it changed gear and drove out without even stopping. He didn't even come in. As he took off, as he took off around the corner, I'm slung between my two friends watching this happen. I think you're in a Grand Prix or something. <laughs> And I can't whistle. I'm dehydrated. My friend lets me go, chases after the guy whistling, doing a huge wolf, wolf whistle, trying to get the guy's attention. Fortunately, he stops him in the road before he gets up onto the main road. The guy backs up. The other security guard throws me in, you know, gets me into the ambulance. We take off. 
As we race towards the hospital, uh, it's on a ridge, but they inadvertently put my feet in the front seat, my head's in the back seat. As I begin to climb the ridge to where the hospital is, the toxin that's now in my lower body starts to naturally drain down into my lungs, into my heart, and I feel it starting sweeping into my brain, and I feel compartments of my mind literally shutting down with the poison. It's a weird sensation, but I knew I was dying. As this continued to happen, I start to see on the inside of the ambulance what appears to be a small boy with white hair. I see sections of some kid's life with snow white hair. I then realize as I'm looking at it that this is me. This is sections of my own personal life. I thought, am I that close? With my mind, I did a mental check, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Of my own vital signs. My mind told me I am very close to death. As I'm lying there, I think, well, I, tr I could be that close to death. I may not make it. I thought, if I don't make it and die before I get to the hospital, what would happen to me? Is there life after death? Or when a man dies, is that it? Finished. Cessation life. Well, as, as a heathen, as an atheist, I reckon when you die, it was all over. The trouble was, I wasn't sure. How many know you can be wrong? You know I mean? <laughs> you ever been wrong in your life? Well, I was a gambler, and I'm gambling with my life here. I think, hey, if I'm wrong here, I'm gambling. It's like Russian roulette. I could, I could be wrong here. I, th I have no idea what will happen to me if I, if I died. As I lay there, I began to see appear now before me my mother. As I saw her, I was amazed because as I looked at her, I could see she was praying. I thought, what's my mum doing here? As I saw her praying, she looked straight up into my eyes. She said these words. She said, Ian, no matter what you've done in your life, son, no matter how far from God you may be, if you will but call out to God from your heart, God will hear you and God will forgive you, son. I thought, forgive me, God? What's all this stuff about God? Is there a God? I had no idea until I returned back to New Zealand that at that precise moment on the other side of the world, my mother was on her knees praying for me. She is the only believer in our family. And she had prayed every day of our lives, all the kids, the whole family, day, every day, every one of them. And God had just spoken to her in prayer and said, your eldest son Ian is nearly dead. Pray for him now. I thank God for a, a woman who knew God and didn't give up on her son and kept praying even to the end. Please don't miss part two of this three-part series when Ian McCormack will reveal what he experienced when God spoke to him face to face. Some of you might be saying, how can this possibly be true? I want you to know that with God, all things are possible. Believe me, I know. Until next program, goodbye. You've been watching Revelation, the program with a biblical perspective. For further, you're watching Revelation, the program with a biblical perspective. To follow on from the previous program, we will now see part two of the three-part series of Ian McCormack's testimony. The young man who was stung by the deadly box jellyfish and he was pronounced dead by the hospital doctors, they tied a tag on his toe and placed him in the morgue. But he then found himself first in hell, and then later he was standing before the living God. Ian did not believe in either heaven or hell before this experience, but he now testifies about these places because God gave him his life back in order to encourage us that there is life after death, and there is a new heaven and a new earth which God has prepared for those who believe, just as promised in the Bible book of Revelation, chapter 21. Be encouraged. I thought, well, maybe there is a God. If there is, who is he? I've seen thousands of them. Everyone thinks their God's the right one. And when you're dying, you'd like to know who it is, you know? You don't want to back a loser. Not if you're a gambler. No. <laughs> so I'm lying here thinking, I don't know. If there is a God, who could he possibly be? I lay there and said, God, I don't even know if you're real. I don't even know if you can hear me. But if you can, I'd have no idea what to pray. You know what I mean? Could you please help me to pray if you can hear me? As I lay there, words began to appear in front of my eyes. It said, forgive us our trespasses and sins. As I saw those words, I thought, how on earth could God forgive me? I mean, it's too late. You know what I mean? And I lay there and I thought, nah, God couldn't forgive me. I've done too many things wrong. I feel like a hypocrite even trying to ask that. My mother started saying in this vision, son, pray from your heart. I thought, from my heart, my heart is like stone. You could strike a match on it. I said, God, I don't know if you could forgive me. 
I don't even know if there's anything soft left in my heart, but if you can, I sincerely ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Please forgive me. As I said that, the words disappeared in front of me. More words appeared. Forgive those who have trespassed and sinned against you. I thought that means forgive other people. I could do that. I'm not a vindictive person by nature. God, I can forgive anyone, no worries. No matter what people have done to me, I forgive those that have sinned against me. As I said that, the face of the Indian taxi driver appeared in front of me. I thought, what on earth is this man doing here? The voice said, will you forgive this man for pushing you out of his taxi tonight and leaving you for dead on the side of the road? I thought, no, you must be joking. Not forgiving him. I mean, I was furious with that guy. And the next minute, the Chinese guy's face appeared in front of me. I thought, what on earth is he doing here? And the voice said, will you forgive this man for not taking you in his car tonight and leaving you to die in the hotel? I thought, no. As I saw both of these men's faces, I thought, who on earth is this voice? Who am I speaking to? Who's talking to me? These words, my mother called them the Lord's Prayer. Am I speaking to God or something? Is he actually talking to me? I lay there, thought, I don't want to forgive these men. I thought, man, this stuff could be real. I lay there almost like in a catch-22 situation. Part of me just wanted to deal out to them. I mean, I wanted to lay hands on those guys. <laughs> not, not in a theocratic way. <laughs> yeah, not like the priest would do, yeah. you know, God bless you, my yeah. son. My hands are going up around his throat, man. Like, you have a problem breathing. Yes. Don't worry, man. Be happy. I mean, I strangled them. I mean, I'm lying here dying, and I've got two men's faces before me. So this is where the rubber meets the road. This couldn't be just some mumbo-jumbo Santa Claus and the Tooth Theory stuff. This could be real. I lay there and thought, God, I don't want to forgive them. But God, if you can forgive me of all the stuff I've done wrong in my life, and I don't know how you could do it, but if you can somehow forgive me for the people I've hurt, I'll forgive these men. I'll never touch them. I'll never lay my hands upon them. I let them go. Their faces instantly disappeared. Fresh words. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I thought that's God's will. I've done my own will for 24 years. You know, I'm independent, self-sufficient. I said, God, I don't know your will, but it appears as only a miracle will spare my life at this point. God, if you are real and you can hear me, I give my will to you. I surrender my life to you. I will try and follow you all the days of my life. As if I come through this, as I prayed that, the entire Lord's Prayer appeared. You know, our Father, which art in heaven. As I prayed it, I understood each letter. It was like I understood for the first time in my life that I was talking to God in this prayer. An amazing peace settled upon me, and I knew as best I knew how, should there be a God, you know what I mean, and He was real, I'd try to make peace with Him. You know what I mean? And as I prayed that prayer, uh, the ambulance seemed to stop. You ever been in a car accident where everything goes into like slow, slow motion? motion? Yeah. I felt like in that ambulance, time seemed to have stopped as my heart was dealt with before God. And I had no idea how pivotal that prayer was, how powerful that prayer, pray for my heart, would mean in the things that were going to take place next. No understanding, really, of, of how important that prayer was. As, I, as the ambulance stopped, they lifted me into the wheelchair, raced me through the accident emergency. First person saw me was a nurse. She pulled my sweatshirt up, tried to take my blood pressure. She pumped her machine up. I watched her look at her machine and shake it. I thought, what's wrong with it? She hit the top of it turned to me, it's like, there's something either wrong with you or the machine. Th thought the sh machine must be, must, must be broken, pulled it off my arm, pulled another blood pressure machine out, stuck it on my arm with the hoses, pumped it up, and then again hit the top of this one. Crouched down and started tapping the side glass where the mercury is supposed to move for the pressure with a fingernail. At this point, I can feel myself like in a third party, almost like I'm watching this going on, uh, it, you know, I mean, I knew this wasn't astral projection. I knew this, was, this wasn't some drug. This was death. I knew if I left my body, it was a one-way ticket. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I was so close to death that I couldn't even hear my heart beating. So I watched this nurse playing with the machines. I thought, I'm in serious trouble. My veins might have collapsed. The nurse just stared there blankly like, I shouldn't be alive. The ambulance driver ripped it off my arm pushed her to one side and raced me towards the doctors. He knew I was in trouble. As the ambulance driver raced me towards the doctors, the first doctor didn't even look at me. He's got his head down and went, Kalaje Teal, Ua La Habit. In French, he's asking me how old I am and where I live. And I'm thinking, well, hurry up and look at me, son. Otherwise, I'm not going to be here. Who cares about my address? I'm gone. As he looked up, 
I thought he speaks French, perhaps he's not good in his English. I looked at the older doctor to his left, he wasn't looking at me either. He stared up because there was such a silence in the room. As he looked into me, I locked onto his eyes and said, Sir, I am nearly dead. I've been stung by sunk, five, on the Zab jellyfish. I need antitoxins now. I'm nearly dead. The nurse came sprinting in past me with her blood pressure results, passed them to the old doctor. He saw them, and whatever he saw caused the entire accident emergency to come to life. You ever been in an accident emergency? I mean, you have to be serious before someone moves in there. As I watched these men run, I watched people appear from nowhere with drip feeds and, and syringes. Suddenly they started shoving needles into me. The doctor saying, come on, son, keep your eyes open. We're going to try and save your life. Antitoxins for the, for the poison. Drip feed dextrose for the dehydration, sugar solution. Come on, son. Got a smash in my hand, lifting my skin up, and stuck a syringe between my second and third finger. I had no idea what they were doing to begin with. Then I saw my veins start to balloon out, bubble out, and I realized they were looking for a vein, which had collapsed. As they hit the vein, the nurse was so nervous, her needle was bouncing from side to side. My vein came up to about here, full of fluid, didn't seem to be moving. I watched this nurse manually try and massage it up my forearm to no avail. It seemed to be rolling off a thumb and forefinger. I thought, man, my veins are collapsed. I'm in trouble here. But I'm lying there thinking, this is not going to take me out. I've been in enough sessions over the years. I'm going to stay here and snap the back of this. It's not going to take me down. And I used every ounce of strength I could to keep my eyes open. But with this perspiration coming in, couldn't see properly. My lips wouldn't respond. So I tried to lift my arms up to clear my eyes, you know, and so I could see properly. Both arms are now totally paralysed, they wouldn't move. I thought, no. I tried to tilt my head to the right or the left, thinking if I can move it enough, it'll get my eye clear so I can continue to see. My neck wouldn't respond, the paralysis set into my neck. Now I'm, now I'm in serious trouble. I can now try and squeeze my eyelids which is helping clear some of the fluid, but as I do it stronger, I can feel the poison going back through the capillaries, back into the back of the eye sockets. I can feel poison being pumped back there, and my eyes getting heavier and heavier, to the point where I realise if I don't close my eyes for a few moments and have a bit of a break here, I mean, I'm going to be no good for anything. So I thought, well, I'll close my eyes, have a sleep for a few moments, and then try again. As I did that, breathed out, a bizarre sensation happened. I, my, the impression of it was like there was a release or like the battle to stay alive had finished. I had no idea until talking to the doctors later. At that point, they came back to find my eyes closed, took my pulse, oh, I was gone. They lost me. Mm. I had literally gone. For a period of 15 minutes, I was just a dead corpse, a piece of meat. And they actually moved me out of the accident emergency down uh, what it looks like to be a part of the hospital or morgue or something. Moved me actually bodily down the tropics. They don't leave your body lying around too long. So they moved me out of the accident emergency down into another part of the hospital. And so as for me, I had no idea I'd been pronounced clinically dead. To me, I was asleep. The trouble was, as I closed my eyes, which, you know, things go dark, I suddenly found myself in a standing upright position, wide awake. I knew I was awake. The trouble was, it was pitch black. And my first thought was, why on earth did those doctors go and turn the lights out in here? I mean, that's enough to spin anyone out, you know what I mean? Why on earth would they do that? What kind of hospital is this? As I stood there, wondering how long I'd been asleep for and why the lights were out, you know what I mean? One minute it's a hospital room, next minute it's pitch black. I thought, well, don't freak out. Let your eyes accustomed to the dark. Maybe you've woken up too quick. So I kept looking, thinking my pupils had dilated. No light. Couldn't see a thing. It was pitch black, like a dark room. So, well, well, okay. There must be some light in here somewhere. So I turned around 360 degrees, checking out to see if there's some light. Couldn't see a thing. I thought, well, I'll go and just find a wall, you know, find a wall here, get the light switch, turn it on, see where we are. As I went out to my right, I couldn't find the wall. I thought, that's weird. Have they moved me? Maybe that's why the lights are out. They've moved me down to the general ward while I've been asleep. Mm -hmm. I've woken up. The lights are out. They don't want to wake the other patients. So I thought, well, I'll go back to my bed, find my hospital bed. Should be a lamp near there, and that shouldn't wake too many people up. So I started moving back to the left, groping around looking for my bed. Couldn't find it. I thought, great, you idiot, now you've lost your bed. How on earth did you do that? You know what I mean? You would talk to yourself, so I'm groping around trying to find my hospital bed, can't find it, 
and another thought comes into my mind. It's so dark in here, you can't even see your hand in front of your face. I thought, well, is it that dark? I brought my hand up. As it did towards my face, my hand seemed to pass straight through my face, like there was nothing physically there. Thought, That's impossible. You can't miss your head. It's not that dark. Two hands. Brought both hands up to where my face should be, both hands seemed to pass straight through. I thought, where's my arm, my body, my hands? As I went for different parts of where my human form should be, there was nothing physically there. It was like you're outside of your body. But before I could think too much about that, I'm thinking, well, what is this place? What's this darkness? As I stood there, I began to tune myself to it. I could sense the darkness had an evil presence, a cold, encroaching evil pervading the atmosphere. Like it wasn't just physical, but there was a spiritual darkness, you know what I mean? Yes. As, like it was evil in there. And as I stood there, I began to sense something on the, out to my right looking at me. In front of me, I felt like invisible eyes of something or someone checking me out. You ever felt that? Ever kind of felt like when you're walking home at night, sometimes someone's checking oh. you out and you get a bit of a chill through your spine? Mm -hmm. Well, you intensify that about a hundred times over. Oh, I'm standing there sensing not only something, but there's something moving towards me. As I feel the movement in this darkness towards me, I move back. As I do, a man screams at me to the right out of the midst of the darkness and says this, Shut up! I went, mean, shut up? I said, nothing. What are you talking about? You know, responding to him, I braced myself for a hit. As I did that, another voice of a man screamed at me to the left. He said, you deserve to be here. Deserve to be where? Where am I? Another man in front of me. You're in hell. Now shut up. Well, I believe in hell. I was an atheist. I believed hell was a religious trip put on people to scare them into their religion. I thought all religions are based in fear. If there was a hell, it'd be a party time. You know what I mean? The injury headbanging stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Sex and drugs and rock and roll. You know what I mean? I'm thinking that's what it'll be. Party time. Everything you can't do up here, you can get away with down there. I thought I'd rather be down there than up, up there in the clouds with a white <laughs> sheet on, having some, some little given a harp to play, you know what I mean? And some little fat baby with, with wings on firing arrows at me. I thought I'd rather be, you know, down oh, yeah. here partying than up there in the clouds yeah. playing the harp or something. I mean, really. <laughs> but see, both of those concepts just went out the window. I'm standing not down to party time with the lads. I'm standing here outside of my physical body. Pretty hard to grab your bear down there, isn't it? Great. <laughs> Can't find your face. I mean, and, and jokes aside, you wouldn't want your worst enemy to go there. It was like I was standing there. I thought, man, this is like a holding tank. This is like, I mean, this could be real. It's not the place where your physical body goes, because I realized my physical body must be up in the hospital. You know what I mean? That's where I'm the, uh, for, for guy. Aware of a lot of it's stuff. like you're suddenly getting a download of reality. This could be the pit. Yeah. And these men are in the same place. And your thought is like speech to them. You could be there five minutes to 5,000 years. You can't get tired. You can't tell time. You could actually be here. This could be it. As I stood there, realizing I could actually be in hell, in total darkness, a radiant beam of light pierced through the darkness above me. As this light touched my face, I felt an awesome presence go through me, and my entire body seemed to lift off the ground and be translated up into this light and radiance. As I'm being drawn up into it, I can see that it's coming from a circular shape opening far above me, that this light is emanating out of a circular opening. I feel like a speck of dust being drawn towards this light. As I'm being drawn up towards it, I thought, is this real? I look back over my shoulder and far beneath me, I could see the darkness. Somehow this light had pinpointed me and plucked me out of it. Still not understanding what this light was, I began to move up to the opening, enter it. As I was drawn into the opening, I could now see that it was a tunnel, circular in shape. As I looked along the length of it, I could see the, the source of the radiance. My first thought is the center of the universe. Look at the light. Look at the power coming from there. And moving into the tunnel, I, I knew I wasn't walking. I was being translated through the air and at a supernatural speed, drawn towards the light. As I've been moved towards it, I watch as a wave of radiance comes up. As this wave of light comes off the source, it touches me and I feel warmth, mm -hmm. comfort. All that kind of fear and darkness just seems to go out of me and I feel a living light go through me. As I moved through it, I thought in the darkness, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. 
maybe in this radiant light I can see something. So I turned my head, you know what I mean, to look. As I looked to my right, I saw my arm and my hand outstretched, because I mean, I've been drawn towards it. As I looked, my arm was transparent, full of light, totally full of radiance. I thought, that's bizarre. I'd stop in the tunnel. I thought, I don't want to stop here. I want to see more. I don't know what's happened to me, but I want to see what's down there. As I continued to look back to the source of the radiance, I felt myself again move along the tunnel towards it. As I did, another wave of light came up. As this wave of radiance passed into me, joy, total joy, filled me. I thought, that's awesome. What am I going to see next is going to be the most incredible thing a man could possibly see. As I popped out of the tunnel, I watched now where the tunnel had constricted the size and diameter of the light I could see. I now had unrestricted access to the radiance. As I looked out, I could see I was standing in what appeared to be the center of the universe. All light and power seemed to be directly in front of me. Shafts of radiance came out from the central core. It was like a white fire. Phenomenal radiance in, in the central core. From that, I watched this brilliant light piercing out. And I thought, even the stars in the universe, even the constellations, must find their energy source from this focal point. What is that light? Is there someone in there surrounded by this radiance? Or is that just an energy source in the cosmos? Is that just some power source of good in the universe? Or is there a person or a being in that radiance? As I questioned that in my own mind, a voice spoke to me from the center of the light. The voice said, Ian, do you wish to return? As I heard this man's voice, I instantly recognized it be the same one that spoke to me on the side of the road where I nearly closed my eyes and died. The same voice that asked me to beg for my life, the same voice that spoke to me in the ambulance, asked me if I'd forgive these men. As I heard his voice, I thought, he knows my name, there is someone, but return where? Where am I? As I looked behind, I could see the same circular shape opening, like the tunnel that I'd apparently just traveled down, dissipating back into darkness. I thought, darkness, hospital bed, my physical body. Have I left my physical form? Have I actually come up this tunnel of light? Is this real? Am I standing here out of my physical form? Or am I comatized in the hospital having some bizarre dream or hallucination? Am I alive or am I dead? Well, in my mind, I could cognitively think of the two alternatives. You don't leave your mind behind. Mm -hmm. And as I stood there grappling with what was reality, I thought, this could be real. I could actually be dead. Maybe I did die. Perhaps I'm standing here. I thought, but return where? I responded to the question. I said, I don't even know where I am. If I'm out of my physical body, I wish to return. I have no idea where I am. As I spoke that to him, he spoke to me again. He said, Ian, if you wish to return, you must see in a new light. I thought, if I want to go back, I must see in a new light. What does that mean? Light. See the light. Look at this light. Am I seeing the light? It must be. Look at this. It's a phenomenal radiance. Are you the true light? As I asked the question to the person who was speaking to me, words appeared in front of my eyes. God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. 1 John 1 5. I thought I've read this somewhere. A Christmas card in South Africa in Cape Town in Bantry Bay. I remember reading this, but I didn't know what the 1 John 1 5 was. I thought there were hieroglyphics, Roman or, you know what I mean, Egyptian, something. I had no idea what that numerology was. But what I, these words had fascinated me because it said, God is light. Every other philosophy or religion I'd ever heard anyone expound on said that God is yin and yang, light and dark, good and evil, in the circle of life, as they used to tell me, in their philosophy and their religion. God had both light and darkness in him. They said, well, you've got good and evil in your ear, so therefore, if you're created in the image of God, God must. But this teaching said, no, God is pure light. Man might have good and evil in him, but God has none. He is pure light. As I stood there... I thought, could that be God? And in him there's no darkness at all. I've just come from darkness. Whoever this person is, whoever this being is, there is no darkness, no shadow, nothing but light. Could that be God? 
as I'm standing there, I'm thinking, well, it could be. Look at the intensity and power that's surrounding him. Look at the phenomenal light. And whoever he is, he knows my name. And he knows what I'm thinking. Before I even speak, he knows my inner thought. I thought only God could do that. I thought if that is God and God is light, then his light and presence must be able to search my inner man. His spirit must be able to see everything that I've done wrong in my life. You know, you can put a masquerade or a mask up before people. You know what I mean? You can fool people. But here, I knew that all the masquerades and masks of my life were gone. I was undone. That that light was penetrating and searching the depth of me. I thought, that made a mistake here. I shouldn't be here. I'm not a good man. I should crawl back under some rock or go back into the darkness where I belong. I don't want God to see my life transparent before him. Have you ever been ashamed of stuff? I mean, I've done some stuff. I thought, no. Nah. Oh, I've done that stuff, man. I, I just could, I knew myself. I began to pull back. And as I began to pull back towards the darkness of the tunnel, I watched a wave of radiance come off him and move towards me. I expected it to touch me and literally catapult me back into the pit. But as this wave of light emanated forth off him, it moved through me. And all I got was love. I thought, you can't love me, I've cursed you. More love came. This time it got stronger. I said, why are you loving me, God? Don't you know what I've done? More love. I said, I slept around, taking heaps of drugs, more of his love. I couldn't believe my whole body tingled with a supernatural presence as love and forgiveness and acceptance just came to issue forth from him. It's like he was completely embracing me with his presence no matter what I'd done wrong. I couldn't understand it. Eh? I felt myself beginning to weep. As I began to weep, the love got stronger. I could feel this liquid love moving through me and filling me up on the inside. I felt the entire part of my being being filled with light, but more tears kept coming. It was like I just couldn't understand that God could accept me as I was. As it continued to come, I, look, I looked out to see I was now surrounded, encased in radiance, my entire person was full of light and I was totally at peace. As I stood there, I watched the waves of light ebb and then cease. And I thought, I wonder if I could possibly step through the light that surrounds God. I thought, I'm so close. I wonder if he let me in. I stood there and said, God, could I come in? I want to ask you the meaning and truth to life. He said nothing. So I thought, if he can love and accept me as I am, surely he won't mind. So I stepped towards the radiance. As I did, I found myself disappear into this light. It was so dense. It was like a cloud. As I moved into it, I was now where inside the light were like shimmering veils of fluorescence. It was almost like small stars caught inside this cloud, giving off facets of radiance, sparkling, shimmering, like the facets of almost a cut diamond, how it gives off light. But it wasn't physical in the sense that it was, wasn't stones or, or diamonds. It was actually light breaking forth in this cloud. As I moved through veils of this light, an amazing healing presence was coming forth off the light. It was like a healing property was touching my broken heart. You know what I mean? I could feel my heart of hearts being healed. I mean, I'd look for love and sex and stuff, but this was pure. You know what I mean? This wasn't some degenerate, you know, sicko stuff. This was pure. And it was just touching. That's yeah, the depths of me, man. I knew what sex and, and, and that stuff was, but this was pure love, no strings attached. As I continued to move through, I thought, is there any way that God would let me see him? Because all I'm seeing is this light. Could I see God? Well, I just see this radiance. As I moved in, it suddenly began to part. As the light began to open up, I became aware that, that standing in the center, I began to make out a man's bare feet. Around his ankles were dazzling white robes, garments, not garments of cloth, but garments of light. As I looked out and saw that, I began to lift my face up to see the chest of a man and, and his arms were outstretched with dazzling white robes as if to welcome me. But as I looked towards his face, 
I, I almost had to turn away. Because as I saw the light and radiance coming off his face, I turned because it was so pure. And the, 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 it was seven times brighter than all the light that I'd just seen. This light seemed to eclipse everything I'd walked in through. His face shone like the light was coming out of the pores of his skin. I could make out the form of the features of the outs, you know what I mean, like the hair, but I couldn't see the actual facial features because the light was so brilliant. I began walking closer towards him, thinking that must be God. I wonder if I could just see his face. I'll know who God is. As I got within a few feet of his presence, I began to place my face into the light. As my, and it didn't hurt your eyes. It was like you could look into it. As I placed my face closer in towards his face, hoping I'd break through that veil, as my face did, he suddenly moved. I thought, why has he done that? He's, I've got so close, I couldn't see his face. As he moved, all the radiance moved with him. Please don't miss part three, the conclusion of this three-part series when Ian McCormack reveals what he saw of the new earth that God had promised as recorded in the Bible book of Revelation, chapter 21. Until the next program, goodbye. You've been watching Revelation, the program with a biblical perspective. For further information on this or other programs, please go to our website, www.rtv.uk.com or telephone 0208 255 3333. We are interested in your comments and welcome any biblically based questions that you may have. Address your emails to comments at rtv.uk.com. Thank you for watching. You're watching Revelation, the program with a biblical perspective. To follow on from the previous programs, we'll now see part three, the conclusion of the three-part series of Ian McCormack's testimony. The young man who was stung by the deadly box jellyfish was pronounced dead by the hospital doctors, tied a tag on his toe and placed him in the wall. He then found himself first in hell and then later was standing before the living God. Ian did not believe in either heaven or hell before this experience, but he now testifies about these places because God gave him his life back in order to encourage us that there is life after death, there's a new heaven and a new earth which God has prepared for those who believe. Just as promised in the Bible book of Revelation chapter 21. Check it out. Here is the final part of this very fascinating testimony. I began walking closer towards him, thinking that must be God. I wonder if I could just see his face. I'll know who God is. As I got within a few feet of his presence, I began to place my face into the light. As my, and it didn't hurt your eyes. It was like you could look into it. As I placed my face closer in towards his face, hoping I'd break through that veil, as my face did, he suddenly moved. I thought, why has he done that? He's, I've got so close, I couldn't see his face. As he moved, all the radiance moved with him, and directly behind him, the same circular-shaped diameter as the tunnel, I could see it opening out, and in front of me, like standing in almost like in a cave entrance, I could see, looking out from this entrance, a green fields, meadows, fields opening up before my very eyes. As I looked out, it looked like a new planet. I could see a crystal clear stream working its way through. It was like, like Earth, but untouched, you know what I mean? A totally new Earth. New Earth. Every single part of me has gone, I've made it. <laughs> Somehow, <laughs> by the skin of my teeth, I have made it. I mean, I knew that somehow I belonged here. It was like I knew I was home. I was wondering why on earth wasn't I born here in the first place? Why was I Bypass born on this miserable planet? Why? Because you must be born again of the Spirit of God. You must have a rebirth and you're in a man to enter into here. But I'm standing here not realizing that's what had happened in the ambulance, that that prayer, I'd actually had a rebirth in that prayer, that deathbed prayer. I had no idea that God had heard that and actually moved upon my spirit and washed my inner man as white as snow, crystal clear.
as I'm standing there looking in, all I want to do is explore. I mean, <laughs> I thought my feet won't touch the ground. I can see the pasture had the same life force that was upon the presence of God emanating right through it. I knew if I stepped on it, it would spring back. The light is like everything was giving off life. As I started to move in, his presence came right back in front of me and blocked the way. He asked me this question. He said, Ian, now that you've seen, do you wish to go in or do you wish to return? I thought, return? What for? I wish to go in. He didn't move. I said, I have no one to return for. I'm a single man. I am not married. I have no children or none that I know of. Please allow me in. He didn't move. Because I thought if God, you know what I mean, knew my life, he'd know that maybe I've fathered some child illegitimately. I thought, maybe I've wrecked some young girl's life. You know what I mean? And God knows that. He wants me to go back and father that child. And when you're standing before God, you're not some big smart aleck or mouthing off. You just know he can see you and you just want to be right. I mean, I thought, maybe I've done something wrong. I've got to go back. As I stood there, he didn't move. I said, God, I don't know any money. Uh, please allow me in. No mortgage, no debt. Still nothing. I said, in my life, no one's ever loved me. No one in my life has ever truly loved me. Your love has touched my heart. I've never felt such pure love. Can I stay here? I have no desire to go back. Everyone wants to manipulate you, control you. Hidden agenda, strings attached. But your love and acceptance is the most pure thing I've ever found in my life. No one's ever cared for me like that. No one's ever loved me like that. I have no one to return for. He didn't move. So I thought, then permit me to say one last thing. Goodbye, cruel world. And I was going to take my chances and try and step through the light and hope that God wouldn't stop me. As I looked back to do that, directly behind me, my, God showed me a vision of one person who loved me, one person who not only cared for me and accepted me, but had prayed for me all the days of my life. As I looked at her, I saw my mother in a clear vision right behind me. The moment I saw her, I thought, man, if I am dead, what will hap what, what's, what's going to happen if I do step through? If I do step through, could I tell my mum that I made it? Could I communicate with her from this place? I thought, I don't know. I don't want to risk it. I thought, if I am dead and I step through, will my mother have any idea that in that ambulance I prayed? Will she have any idea that I gave my life to God and that God could forgive me? And I thought, no, she'll think a heathenistic son went straight to hell. She'd have no reason to believe I'd pray. Why? My lifestyle is completely antichrist stuff. As I stood there, I thought, God, I wish to return for my mum. I've led such a selfish life. I want to return and tell her what she believes in is real. If I come back, I'll find, you know what I mean? If I go back, I'll find out where this place is and I'm coming back whether anyone believes me or not. I mean, whether anyone believes me, I don't really care. I know if I die right now, I'm out of here. I'm going to go straight up into his presence because I know that I've made peace with my maker. I know that he has forgiven me, accepted me, and I know that he'll take me back into his presence. Total assurance in my heart, not an ounce of fear or death in me. And as I stood there, I said, God, you know what I mean, how do I return? Uh, you know what I mean, and tell my mum. He said, son, if you wish to return, you must see things in a new light from his eternal perspective, not my own. And see, when the love of God comes into you, you start to see and love people from a totally different place. And I said, well, then how do I go back down that tunnel? As I look back towards it, directly behind me now was not only my mum, and I see now my dad, my brother, and my sister, like a clear vision with thousands and thousands of other people, never seen before in my life. I said, God, what are all these people? He said, Ian, if you don't return, many of these people will most likely not step foot inside a church any longer to hear my name. I said, church? Well, neither would I. I wouldn't. I don't even know these people. I know my mum. I wish to return for her. I love her. He said, Ian, I love these people. I desire all of them to come to know me. And I thought, what? See, my heart was like, you know, look after your own. Here, God's telling me his heart is for everyone. I just see hundreds of thousands of people. I had no idea what I'm fully seeing, but I just know the heart of God reaching out towards all these other people. I said, well, God, I don't know about them, but how do I go back down that tunnel, back into darkness and back into my physical body? I don't even know how I came here. He said, son, tilt your head. Now feel the liquid drain from your eye. Now open your eye and see. I'm instantly back with my head tilted, which I hadn't been able to do, with my right eye open, looking down the length of my body, 
to see my right leg elevated, cupped in the hands of the young doctor who'd been working on me before with the needles, and with a knife in his hand, scalpel or something, prodding the base of my foot like a dead piece of meat. As I open my and see this happening, I thought, what's happened? God, I think I'm dead or something? What on earth is he doing my foot? I'm thinking, did I just see God? See, it was so sudden. It would have been a lot easier, I think, if God let me float down out of the heavens, you know I mean, down through the clouds, down through the hospital, seeing this the back into my body. But I am instantly, as he spoke, I found out later that God has power, that when he spake, spoke, things come to life. I mean, even things that are dead can come back to life when God speaks, because there's creative power in the spoken voice of God. I found myself lying there looking at this doctor who suddenly gets spooked, you know what I mean? Like he, something happens and he turns and sees my one eye looking at him. The moment he sees my one eye staring into his two eyes, he goes as white as a sheet and nearly goes through the ceiling. Ah, you know, I thought, what on earth's going on? Now watch him look again. This time he could see him thinking maybe he said a nerve, because the nerve endings to your spine are the base of the feet. Maybe he said a nerve with a knife, you know what I mean? Hit a nerve ending, caused the corpse to have an involuntary twitch or something. He's got an evil eye or a dead man's eye looking at him. Yeah. As he's staring with his two eyes frantically into mine, like maybe the corpse has moved, I'm thinking, what on earth's going on here? I hear the voice of God break through my thoughts. He said, Ian, I have just given your life back. I went, what? God, if that's true, no wonder this man has no idea what's going on. Could you please help me tilt my head to the left and look out the other eye? I'm getting sick of looking at him. As I felt strength come back to my neck, it rolled. My left eye drained and 10 feet away in the doorway were nurses and orderlies staring in at my left eye opening. They freaked. One nurse was crouched down. She jumped back and knocked the girl who was over her shoulder, nearly knocked the jaw off. Oh, I thought, what on earth is this? I looked back at the doctor. He was still holding my foot, trembling, shaking like a leaf. I thought, there must be a logical reason. Maybe there's a doctor to my right, you know, with a kickstart on the heart. Yeah. I turn, no one there. I thought, that's impossible. I looked to my left, no one. Still the doctor's holding my foot. The nurses and all these are panicking. I'm going, you can't bring a man back to life by holding onto his right foot or gaping through a door. You need mouth-to-mouth, CPR, or, you know, the kickstart on the heart. As I'm looking at this, I'm figuring out, say, maybe I have seen God. When the doctors come and tell me 15 minutes and start reattaching the drip feed, I realize this is freaky. I'm thinking, if I've just seen God, that means my life has got to change. I thought, wow, where do you start? I mean, where do you start, eh? No, that I'm a write-off. Where do I start to follow God? I lay there realizing that if I've been dead that long, I could be on a machine. I thought, well, I may never even get out of the hospital if I've been dead that long. I thought, God, if you've just given my life back, could you please do another miracle? Could you please heal me and enable me to walk out of this hospital and live a normal life? If not, I'd rather be dead. Please take me back into your presence. I'd rather be dead than on a machine. As I lay there, I felt this warmth and power, almost in the natural like electricity, but I now know it to be the supernatural presence of God. As this power like electricity began to move through me in successive waves, I felt healing move into me, and within a three or four hours, I got total movement and feeling back. They moved me to the general ward, and, and the next day I discharged myself from the hospital, walked out under my own steam, completely healed. I believe in the supernatural healing power of God. As I walked out, the fishermen in the village saw me come back into the village and thought I was a ghost come back from the dead to haunt them. They ran. Some picked up stones and called me a spirit. They thought I was a spirit coming back to torment them. I began immediately to see in the supernatural realm. I began to look at people and knew what was going on in their life. I could see what was oppressing them, what was coming against them. And I said, God, why is that? He said, you're seeing people in a new light. He said, don't judge people. He said, I want to heal them, set them free from the oppression of the darkness that's tormented them. I want to see them set free out of darkness and brought into my light. I said, God, what am I? What's going on? I'm not chasing ladies anymore. I don't want to party. I don't want to get drunk or stoned. Every part of me wants to live a pure life. It's a radical change for me. What's happened to me? He said, Ian, you are a reborn Christian. That prayer in that ambulance saved your soul, son. I said, God, what must I do then? He said, read a Bible. I said, well, I don't even know what reborn Christian is. I've never read a Bible. He said, your father's got one. 
back in New Zealand for the first time in my life, I asked my dad for a Bible. He had one stashed away in the closet. I, he pulled it out, gave it to me, and within six weeks, I read the entire scriptures from Genesis to Revelations. As I read it, I began to weep. I thought, you arrogant pig, you have mocked this stuff out from a distance. You have foul-mouthed and cursed God. You have never taken the time to read this book. You fool. As I read, I began to see stuff that I'd seen mentioned in the Scriptures. As I began to read, I said, God, what happened to me? He said, Ian, in that ambulance, you prayed a prayer out of Matthew chapter 6. That prayer was called the Lord's Prayer. That prayer prayed from your heart, saved your soul. You asked forgiveness of your sins. I forgave you right there. I said, why do you have to forgive the Chinese and Indian man? He said, Ian, because if you don't forgive others that have sinned against you, that bitterness and anger and hatred and revenge in your heart is like a cancer. It'll eat you up. He said, but if you forgive others that have sinned against you, I can then come and heal your broken heart. He said, Matthew 6, 14 and 15, you must forgive others that have sinned against you. He said, on the cross, I mean, I forgave those who crucified my son. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I said, God, what was that thing about lordship? He said, when you gave your will to me, you, you made me Lord. When you asked forgiveness, I became your saviour. Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans chapter 10. He said, that deathbed prayer saved your soul right there in the ambulance. I said, God, then, then what's this? You know, I mean, I seem to leave my body of something. He said, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, when a man dies, his spirit leaves his body and returns to God. His physical body, God says, is just mere ash and dust. I said, I seem to go through darkness. Where is that mentioned in the Bible? He said, Acts 26, verse 18, Jude chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 2, there is a kingdom of darkness which is ruled by Lucifer, Satan, and he said, but there is a kingdom of light ruled by my son. I said, and why did you take me through the darkness? He said, Ian, I took you through that outer darkness to show you where you should have gone. Had you not prayed in the ambulance and given your life to me, I would have left you in outer darkness until the day of judgment. You'd have been held in chains of darkness until then. I said, God, that darkness, men were screaming at me. He said, that's right, other men have been judged and are left there until the, fi the final day of judgment. I said, then why did you take me out? He said, well, you prayed, son. I took you through the valley of the shadow of death and deep darkness, Psalm 23. But evil could not touch you because you made me your personal Lord and shepherd just before you died. I said, God, the light, he said, John 1 verse 5, light shines in the darkness and the darkness flees, does not comprehend. He said, those walking in darkness, Luke 1, 79, have seen a great light and God has guided their feet into the paths of peace and righteousness. He said, those walking in darkness have seen a great light. He said, where could you go for my presence? Psalm 139. Even if you descend to the lower regions of the earth, yet shall I pursue you. He said, God often does this with man. He brings men's souls back from the pit that they might be redeemed and that they might be enlightened with the light of life. Job 33, I think it's verse 23 on, 23 to 25. I said, God, a tunnel, where is that mentioned? He said, Matthew 7, 13 and 14, narrow and small is the way that leads into the presence of God. Few find it. Most find the broad way that leads to destruction and what outer darkness. He said, son, I took you along a highway of holiness. I see God, waves of love, joy and comfort and peace. He said, Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of my Holy Spirit is love, peace and joy. He said, my spirit gives off love. My spirit gives off peace, life, eternal life, resurrection life for those who believe in me. I said, I couldn't see my body. He said, you are a spirit being created in my image. God is a spirit, and we're created in his form. He said, you will not receive your heavenly body until my second coming. He said, then the dead in Christ shall rise, and you shall be with me throughout eternity, and your spirit being will be covered with a new, resurrected, glorified, heavenly body. I said, I moved through the tunnel, and a man was standing there in white light that filled the universe. Who was that? He said, that was my son, Jesus. I said, where is that mentioned? He said, John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus clearly taught he was the light of the world. Those that came to him shall no longer walk in darkness, but have the light of life. 
He said, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus' face began to shine with radiance like light, and his garments were gleaming white light. He said, there was a picture of what I was going to do for my son when he rose from the dead and was to be glorified. He said, what you saw is my glorified son. I said, the light, he said, Revelations 21, verse 23, the light that surrounds Jesus, the light of the world is so bright that in the new heavens and the new earth, you will not need the light of the sun, the light of the moon, or the light of a lamp, because the radiance and glory that comes off Christ, the lamp of God, shall fill eternity. I said, God, I stepped through that light. How could I do that? He said, Ian, the veil has been torn and, and into the Holy of Holies. Through the blood of Jesus, through his sacrifice, we have entry in to the holy place to look upon his form and glory, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and be transformed in our inner man from glory to glory. He said, you could look upon his form and glory, but not look upon his face. I said, why? He said, no man looks upon the face of God and lives. I said, if I'd, what if I'd seen his face? He said, you will see that only when you step through and stay in eternity. Revelations 22 verse 4, we shall see him face to face in eternity. I see God, he moved to one side and, and, he, and, and he stepped aside. He said, my son clearly taught he was the door of life, the door of light, the door to the sheep. John 10 verse 7 and 9. He said, those who came into him shall be saved and go in and out and find green pastures. I said, it was like a door, like a window into eternity. He said, that's right. At the end of the tunnel, there was a door of light, but nothing unclean, nothing of darkness can enter in. Unless I know you, you cannot enter in. He said, it's not just words, it must be the heart. He said, I know the heart of man. Men honor me with their lips, but their heart are far from me. He said, only if you give your heart to me, which is the greatest commandment, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. Until you do that, you cannot be born again. It's done from your heart, from your spirit, not just from your intellect. It's not just an intellectual ascension. It's a heart desire to worship me. I see God, he stepped aside and I saw like a new earth. He said, 2 Peter chapter 3, 10 to 18. God said, I have prepared a new heaven and a new earth for those who love me. Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. If it wasn't so, I would not have told you. And I said, I saw a river. He said, a river of life. I said, I saw a totally new planet. He said, Ian, that is set before those who love me. That this old earth and this heaven will pass away in all-consuming fire, it will melt, the elements will melt, but your spirit will pass through the fire and come through into glory. I said, God, I looked behind me, I saw people, thousands of them. He said, 2 Peter chapter 3, 9, I wish that no one would perish, that all mankind would come to know me. Every man, woman and child would have an opportunity to know my unconditional love and acceptance, be born again in my spirit, come to the foot of the cross, the throne of grace, and find help in their time of need. He said, you can boldly come to the throne of grace and find help in your time of need. I said, I seem to go back into my body. And he said, what's that? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, though they die, yet they shall live. He said, I have power to speak a human spirit back into their body. I rose Lazarus from the dead, who'd been dead for four days, and said, Lazarus, come forth. When I spoke, his spirit instantly came back into his dead body and walked out. He said, when I speak, the worlds came into existence. I am the Word of God. I am the living Word of God. My Son is the Word of God made flesh. I said, then who was Jesus? He said, Jesus is God. He said, when you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father, the, the God, the invisible Father, in human form. He said, he is the, he is the visible form of the invisible God. First, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. He said, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I said, what are you saying? He said, Ian, there's only one name by which man might be saved, Acts 4 verse 12. There's no other name given in the heavens or on earth amongst men by which you might be saved, save the name of Jesus. I said, people say there are hundreds of ways to you. Christianity is only one of the pathways. What do you say? He said, John 14 verse 6, clearly taught through the scriptures, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to me but through my son, Jesus. He said, there is only one pathway, one passageway that brings people into my presence. I said, hundreds of people see that light, move along that tunnel, but don't believe it's you. Why is that? He said, Ian, 
even Lucifer, even Satan can come as an angel of light and deceive people into believing that it's something else. He said, even if an angel or another spirit would come and preach anything but Christ, let him be accursed. Because there are many spirits that talk, but there's only one spirit that's holy, the same spirit that rose my son Jesus from the dead. He said, I want my son's spirit, the Holy Spirit, to dwell with your spirit for you to be adopted one with me, one with the Father. I said, people say that Jesus is one of the faces of God. He said, no, son, when you've seen Jesus, you have seen the incarnate face of God in human form. When you've seen Jesus, he is God. All the other teachers of other religions were mere men. They never proclaimed to be God. Jesus is the only teacher, the only prophet, the only person who said, I am God. They crucified him. He prophesied, if I die, I will rise from the dead. All the other teachers, you'll find their bodies spread from here to Kathmandu, but you'll not find the body or the bones of Jesus. Why? You go into Jerusalem, he has risen. He is no longer here. Why? Because that same resurrection power that rose Christ from the dead will rise those who believe upon him into eternal life, that the power of God will take your human spirit up into glory. I thought that's phenomenal. I said, my mother, he said, that's right, your mother was praying. Her intercessory prayers broke into that ambulance. I said, could she have repented for me? He said, no, she could not have prayed you out of hell and she could not have prayed the prayer of salvation. You must pray yourself and be born again of my spirit. John chapter 3, verse 3. I said, God, many people, people want to know you, but how do they do that? They said, Ian, by asking forgiveness of their sins. He said, what separates mankind from me, a holy God, isn't that, isn't that I don't love them. I love their person, I, the sins that they do, the evil that they do, the pride, the arrogance, the lust, the perversion, the adultery, the drunkenness, the death, the murder that they commit. They have been driven and talked to and listened to, powers of darkness. He said men that have murdered and slaughtered children and butchered them have been inspired and taken over by demonic powers. But he said, I have come to set man free from the power of Satan, the power of evil spirits, to bring them out of bondage, to bring them out of the occult, bring them into the light of my radiance. He said, if a man would choose to follow me, I will set him free, because he, the Son of God, sets free, as free indeed. He said, that's why every demon on this planet must acknowledge the name of Jesus. He said, there are people that are demon-possessed. We lock them up in straitjackets, he said, but we can be set free in the name of Jesus. He said, I have conquered death. I have conquered Lucifer. On the cross, I have taken back the keys of death and Hades. He said, what you saw of that person, that radiant robes? I said, yes, where is that? He said, Revelations chapter 1, verse 13 to 18. In the midst of the lampstands, I started reading the Bible, stood the Son of Man with white robes reaching his feet. I said, I saw that. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. And his face shone like the sun in full strength. In his right hand, he held seven stars. His eyes were like a flame of fire and his voice was like the sound of many waters. I said, who was that? He said, do not be afraid. I was dead, but behold, I am alive forevermore. I hold the keys of death and Hades, death and hell. I am the resurrected, glorified Son of Almighty God, Yeshua Hamashiach, the Messiah. I am the King of kings and Lord of lords. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I am Jesus, Son of God, glorified, the eternal master of the universe. And I thought, I saw Jesus. That was written 2,000 years ago. He said, that's right. That, that vision was a vision of revelation of one of my apostles, John, on the Isle of Patmos. In the Greek islands, he was caught up into the radiant presence of God and saw me in my glorified form. He said, what you saw was the same picture that John saw. I said, well, who am I? He said, son, you are a, you're a man who was walking in darkness and evil. Your life was full of evil, but you were wholehearted. So then I revealed myself to you. I said, people won't believe. He said, that's right. When I rose from the dead, they don't believe me. They still lie about me today. He said, but I have risen from the dead. I said, is there anyone in the Bible had an experience like me? He said, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2 to 4. Paul said, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether he was in his physical body or out of his body, the Bible says God knows that this man was caught up into the third heaven, into paradise. I said, God, what are you saying? He said, people won't believe you, son, because even if the dead come back and preach, they still won't believe. They have the law of the prophets, the law of Moses. He said, Ian, but if they don't believe you, don't worry, refer them to me. If you have people argue theology with you, don't argue with them. Just tell them to talk to me because I know what took place. He said, if they think it was just a vision, that's all right. But I'm the one who knows whether you rose from the dead and whether I gave your life back. 
He said, let him talk to me about it. He said, doctors can make mistakes. You can make mistakes. I said, that's right. I could be wrong. He said, son, but I don't make mistakes. I have called you. I have chosen you. I have appointed you and anointed you to take you to share the love of, of, my, of, of my son, the good news of the gospel to all these thousands of people. Some of them will listen to what you share and say, yes, I want to make peace of God. Yes, I want to be born again. Yes, I want to come out of darkness. I want to know the forgiveness of God and have a clean start. I want to walk in purity. I want to walk in the light of God and be one with him. I want to know his love. He said, son, you can pray with people and they'll respond and give their life to me. He said, that's what you saw. Thousands of people that in eternity are going to come through because they've heard what I've done in your life. And I said, God, can I do that with other people? He said, that's right. All I have to do is just bow in prayer and say, God, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of all my sins. And if that's you, I mean, and you're here tonight, listen to this stuff on TV or whatever, on video, you can give your life to God. He can forgive you, no matter how evil, no matter how messed up you are, no matter how many drugs or women you slept with, no matter how much filth you've been involved in, He can forgive you. No matter how holy you might think you are, God says all people have sinned. And if you want to pray with me, you can give your life to Jesus. Like you bow your head and just with me, wherever you are, say, God, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I ask you to cleanse me and purify me. I believe that Jesus Christ died on that cross and his blood, the blood of his sacrifice, the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse my spirit as white as snow. I humble myself in prayer and say, God, have mercy on me. Forgive me and cleanse me this day. And God, as you forgive me, I forgive others that have sinned against me. As you did on the cross, you forgave those who crucified you. God, I forgive those who have abused me and wounded me, and I give my whole life over to the Lordship of Jesus. I make him Lord of my life and Savior. I choose to walk from this day on in the light of his teaching, the light of his holiness, the light of his Spirit, his Holy Spirit. I invite his Holy Spirit to come in and make Jesus real, to join with my spirit, to be born again of the Spirit of the living Christ. Jesus, my Lord and Savior. I pray this sincerely from my heart. Amen. That's my testimony. But how do I thank you for letting me come, man?